Yeah. Welcome to Goodwill. <laughs> Always like hearing that. You may think you know uh, about Goodwill, but did you know that Goodwill is so much more than a retail store? In fact, uh, proceeds from the store sales fund free career services for people looking for work right here in the community. When it comes to progress in both the business and the service, Jane Second, our speaker, has years of experience. When she took over at Goodwill Southern Rivers in 1999, there was only one community in this area that benefited from Goodwill's free career services. Today, Goodwill Southern Rivers serves a 50-county territory with nine career centers and four education and training centers. Last year, those centers served more than 34,000 people. Back in 1999, Goodwill had about $3.8 million in gross revenue. Today, they have grown to more than $27 million in revenue. Back then, Jane was one of eight female CEOs within Goodwill's family of independent community-based nonprofits. Today, she is one of 56 CEOs, female CEOs, out of 164. Nationally, Goodwill has topped the list of brands that do the most good and has been recognized by Forbes Magazine as one of America's most inspiring companies. Goodwill is number seven on the Forbes 50 largest U.S. charities list. Here at home, uh, Jane's leadership has been commended on many levels. An article in her, mag in her magazine noted, Goodwill Southern Rivers may be a nonprofit, but Jane is driving the organization to heights, uh, in, in, to heights any for-profit community. Please welcome with me uh, in, please, well, please, <laughs> <laughs> I crossed out See, I told words. you the formality thing. I, I crossed out too many words. Please welcome with me Jane Seconder, President and CEO of Goodwill Industries in Southern Rivers. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> Good morning. How's everybody? Good? Okay, so what you probably know about us is you bring us your stuff and we sell it. That's probably all you know. So the best way for you to really understand what Goodwill gets to do with the proceeds from the things you give us to sell is for you to watch Tanya's story. My name is Tanya Jones. I live in Franklin, Georgia. I got moved here nine years ago. I am the volunteer coordinator for Georgia Cares. Georgia Cares is a nonprofit which provides assistance and service to the elderly population as well as the disabled in regard to Medicare assistance. I am married to a, a wonderful person. I have two adult children, um, a son and a daughter. I have three grandchildren. I was diagnosed with vocal cord cancer at the age of 25, having been hoarse for a number of months. And um, being a young person, you really don't think anything terrible like that could occur to you, particularly that I was a non-smoker. At the time I was diagnosed with cancer, I was working with Georgia Power Company in Atlanta. And I continued working there. Um, had a few transfers, a few promotions throughout my career. And um, I ultimately, retired in 2008 after serving 32 years. So after a time, being in the country, being somewhat isolated, I felt that I wanted to work again. I always tell my husband, don't worry, with my skills I can find a job. And when I began job searching, I learned something I had not really acknowledged before, was that I really had a disability. And the search became very frustrating. And I, I was rejected many, many times in the job market. So I continued. And ultimately, that job search led me to the Goodwill Career Center in Carrollton. The Goodwill Career Center impacted my life in such a positive way. They're the only entity, the only and place I went for job searching that treated me with respect, with dignity, with encouragement. When I walked in there, after I initially met Heather, and I came to register for the first time, I was accepted as I was. 
There was no negativity whatsoever. And I began to feel that hope growing inside me. She would send emails, we're having a job fair, come to the job fair. She sent out emails, bulletins, and, and I went to every one. And as it turned out, I did meet someone through one of those job fairs that Heather shared with me. And that was the position I have now. And this place especially is a perfect fit for a person like me. So I'm so grateful. I feel that is part of my purpose that God has designed. I had to walk through my own circumstances in learning to overcome. But if that's a gift, I accept it. The message is this. Really, people who have cancer, they're not victims. It's an opportunity to overcome an obstacle in one's life, to use some that potential they didn't know they had. So our career centers, our education and training centers are available to anybody. And in today's economic environment, there's a lot of need. There's a lot of unemployment. I'm sure many of you have not impacted your own family. You know others around you that have been impacted. How do we do it? You give us your stuff. We sell it in our retail stores. We don't give it away. We sell it. So you can help by donating and shopping. We also have contracts at um, the military installation here at Fort Benning and in Albany. We provide service contracts that employ a majority disabled population. We provide grounds maintenance services and custodial services at both of those installations. I'll share with you that all of the wages that are paid to the disabled population are in full, not just compliance, but the minimum wage that's declared by the federal government, which is $10.10 an hour. That's a good wage. That's a very good wage and it has benefits. So I, I just kind of start with the whole social enterprise background for it to roll around in your head while I start talking a little bit about me. Because I want to share with you my leadership journey. I am very passionate about leadership and I'm very passionate about learning and growing as you mature in your journey here on earth. So let's start with just a little bit about me. Um, born and raised in Albany, Georgia, just south of here. And I um, had two wonderful parents and incredible grandparents. Learned a lot from them. For my mom, she is probably the consummate servant. She finds good in everybody and she encourages everybody. She is the most amazing listener I have ever encountered and a great cook. <laughs> My dad was the opposite. He was the incredible businessman. Second generation construction company, um, constantly working the deals and what I learned from him was don't settle. Sometimes that's a bad thing. Don't settle. You probably asked my staff in the back of the room <laughs> about that one. Um, and to push forward. To, to know that what you're doing today is over today. So you got to be prepared to do something tomorrow. And owning your own small business, I heard him talk about that all the time. What's next? What's next? What's next? That also makes it tough on the daughter wanting to go through school and do the things that girls wanted to do versus what boys wanted to do. So one of the struggles that I had growing up was if it was a B or a B plus and it was truly the best I could do, it wasn't good enough. If it was on the, the cheerleading squad, but it wasn't captain, then it wasn't good enough. So that was, that was a struggle for me. Over the years with my family in the construction business, there were conversations that were had. And somewhere planted in my mind, I was led to believe that girls couldn't be in business and girls couldn't be in construction. Okay? And that was just one of the biases that I grew up with. So the first thing that I did was learn that if I did want to do something, I had to go to school. 
I had to graduate from high school and I had to get an education. And all my life, my grandparents just drilled into me, education is something no one can ever take away from you. And that is just emblazoned in the back of my mind. So I knew college was where I was going. I had no clue in what. None. Had a cousin, and fortunately there are more tools in the world than cousins now to make these decisions. <laughs> but I had a cousin that was a communications major at Georgia Southern. I um, spent a little time with her. I saw that she was having some fun. So guess what I did? I went to Georgia Southern and I became a communications major for two reasons. I saw what it looked like because she was doing it and I didn't have to take any business classes. <laughs> okay? True story. So what happens from there? I graduate, public relations, communications. I think the closest I came to the business school was the marketing classes that were required. Um, you know, I did sports stuff. I did all that kind of fun stuff. Um, went to work at Lockheed Martin. And I had a very interesting um, job. I wrote speeches for the president, Mr. Ormsby, who I learned a lot from. I provided tours in the facility. I can tell you more than you ever wanted to know about C-130s and C-5As and Bs. And I coordinated, and this was the most important thing I could do, I couldn't take Fridays off. Because on Friday, you'd get a list of all of the visitors that were coming in the next week. And I would go into a room where all of the plaques that had ever been given to Lockheed were alphabetized. Okay, who's put this together? Uh-huh. You'd go through and you'd pull the visitors that were coming the next week and you'd go up to where the entrance was and you'd rehang all of the plaques so that they thought when they came in the door that their plaques were displayed. And I was told until that job was done, I couldn't, I couldn't leave. So if I could get it done on Thursdays, I could take Friday off. But if I couldn't get it done, I guess that means I'm 10 minutes in. <laughs> if, I couldn't, if I couldn't get it done, then that's what I was doing on Friday afternoon. So what did I learn at Lockheed? How to tell stories. Mr. Ormsby was an amazing storyteller. And I had the honor and privilege of working with him to tell stories to the federal government, factual, but to tell it in a story format that helped them secure contracts. I also learned from Mr. Ormsby that there is beauty everywhere. He was the most amazing photographer I have ever been around. Worked with black and white constantly, taught me about texture and all types of things. And my first aha was the day, first day I arrived and they said, wear jeans, wear tennis shoes, you're flying across the country. And they threw us in a C5A to photograph a C-130. I have to stop and think about this. We flew to San Francisco. And they strapped us in a jump belt, and I'm not adventurous. I know Jerry's going to laugh. I'll tell you about Jerry in a minute. Jerry in the back of the room is going to laugh. I am not adventurous. I'm very predictable. So they strapped us in a jump belt, and they opened the back of the C-5. How they would load the tanks in, you know how the back opens up? Not a need audience participation. You're following me? Okay. Um, and they slid us, there were three of us with cameras, out the back. And we flew up and down the Golden Gate Bridge until the sun was right and the C-130 could take off from the Air Force Base and fly across. And our job was to capture photographs for promotional reasons. That was my first day on the job. So, um, you know, ignorance is bliss. You just get on the airplane and go and you just do what they say do. So what has happened since then? I left Lockheed, I went to Georgia State University, I worked for Dean Mescon, some of you I think knew Tim when he was here, I worked for his father. And I um, learned a lot about business. How did I learn about business? I didn't take any business classes. We were charged with syndicating, meaning picking a professor, 
that we could package to the local and national media that we could position them so that they would become a household name and an expert when different opportunities would arise in their area of interest and of expertise. We selected, of all things, Don Ratichek, the head of the Economic Forecasting Center. So Don and I put our little plan together and we're riding up in the elevator and it's funny how you remember things. Um, it feels like this really long elevator ride, but the reality is it was two floors, so it really wasn't this long elevator ride. But here's what happened in the elevator. He's a big man, tall man. He said, Jane, is there anything about what we're getting to go pitch that concerns you? And being the communication student that I was, when you didn't want to answer the question, you learned to ask a question and I'd answer the question. I said, well, um, why do you ask? Is there something that concerns you? And he says, yes. He says, I don't like to talk to people. So here we are getting ready to position him to do all of these media tours throughout the United States and he don't want to talk to people. So he, I figured he got pretty transparent and I decided to get transparent and I said, Don, that's real good because when you talk, I don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> I didn't. I had no clue what an economic cycle was. I, I didn't. I had no idea. So we stalled outside of the elevator and reached an agreement. If I would teach him how to tell the story and help him do that, he would spend every hour he could with me teaching me economics. So for the next two years, that's what we did. On Wednesdays, I went in and sat on the floor in his office in front of this horrible beige couch. I wouldn't sit on it. My feet propped out in front of me and he taught me economics and he taught me practical economics and he taught me about how there's cause and effect and it made sense and it was incredibly logical. So we did everything you're not supposed to be able to do without a PR firm. We did the national media tour. He was syndicated in the Wall Street Journal, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, all of Cox Media, all of the things you're not supposed to be able to do. I was recruited to go into banking and real estate. Okay, rewind back. Girls aren't supposed to be in business. You can't go into the construction company. Now I'm being recruited to leave Georgia State University to go to work in the banking industry who happens to own real estate and insurance subsidiaries. That's what I did. I, I made that transition and, and went to work there. Was then recruited from there to move to Columbus to work with um, a developer who was having EPA issues. And that was my job, was to work with them to help them relocate purple flowers so that they could build a large community that is north of Columbus. In the process of all of this, um, a couple of things happened. If I rewind back to my first aha and what's made me the leader I am, it was when Don Ratichek set me on the floor as I got ready to leave and said, I need to tell you something. And I said, okay. And he said, I was an orphan in a private orphanage in the north. And the owner of the orphanage, when I was eight years old, came to me and said, Don, you are very, very smart. If you will always do your best, I will put you through the best schools that exist. And he did, and he had every Ivy League certificate there was hanging on his wall. And I just kept looking at him and he said, so what you need to understand is why I didn't walk into the dean's office and say she doesn't know what she's doing. He said, because I see in you something you didn't see in yourself. So that was my first learning, that everybody has that something and you don't always know it and sometimes you have all these other voices in your head and these other experiences that tell you there's not that something. That was my first aha. My second aha happened when I went to work for that development corporation in this area, who is no longer here, so don't try to figure out who it is. Um, they led by fear and intimidation. The largest, darkest office I have ever experienced, I had to go into every Friday 
and recap the projects and where we were and where was EPA on getting our purple flowers relocated. And literally, there was a chair in the middle of the room and it was one of those old hard oak banker's chairs. I remember it like it sits in my den or something. And the leader of, no, the owner of this development corporation, he was not a leader, <coughs> sat, I bet, 20 feet away from you. The lighting was poor in today's standards. Then it felt dark. And you were drilled. You were absolutely drilled. You were terrified to go in there. Nothing was ever good enough. And it made you feel horrible. Even though we were doing things that were unprecedented. It still made you feel horrible. And then one week, it was a really bad week. And two of my, well, one of my coworkers and one of the contractors that we worked with, two separate incidents happened. The first one was the contract, a contractor got pushed by the owner of this company through a plate glass window. He wasn't hurt very bad, but he was hurt. The second thing that happened was um, the owner of this company got angry and reached over in the middle of the conference room table on a different day and picked up the silver-footed sugar dish, his feet on it, and threw it and hit a coworker in the head to the emergency room we went. That was my second aha in leadership. I walked out. I left. Unemployed on my own and single. I'm not going to treat people like that and I'm not going to be a part of somebody else that treats people like that. You can't compromise your values ever, ever because you can't go back. So rewind, put those pieces together and let's walk to where we are today. Um, did mergers and acquisitions in a bank. I had a three-year-old. I'd served on the board at Goodwill for 10 years, and a couple of the board members kept calling me going, you know, we've got this search going on. We're looking for a new CEO. We think you should do it. I put them off for six months. I didn't, I, you know, I was supposed to be the banker. I was supposed to, you know, do this thing because it, it, it was all the things that I felt like I was supposed to be doing. Well, I wasn't what I was supposed to be doing. So I finally made the decision, sitting in a pub in England with my mother. Um, beverages sometimes clear the mind. Y'all know that, right? <laughs> um, so I'm sitting in a pub in England, and I made the decision, I'm, I'm going to apply for this. I'm just, I'm just going to apply for it. I'm going to go for it. So I did. Um, joined the organization in June of 1999. And... Here's what I walked into. An organization that had lots of money in the bank. That's rare for a nonprofit. Very rare. However, substandard and unsafe facilities, literally unsafe. Phone calls about toilets falling through the floor, uncovering cars in warehouses that they didn't know were there. Truly unsafe facilities. One computer, one in 1999. No health insurance, no paid benefits at all, period, no paid time off. And that's, that's what I walked into. On top of that, a provisional car for accreditation. I know that doesn't mean a lot to you, but for us at Goodwill, that meant we couldn't accomplish our mission. And our largest partners, like United Way, had walked away from the table because of reputation and the conditions that I just described to you. So emotionally, I was mad as fire because I'd been on the board and I had no clue that was going on. Um, we began rebuilding. And we began looking at things. We began, first aha was, um, the Friday that I walked in, my first Friday, and Terry Reese, who's our CFO that's with us today, um, will appreciate this. I walked in and two people come out of the accounting department and they come strolling across the thing and they plop this stack like this on my desk. 
It was the checks I needed to hand sign for the week. Okay, so guess what our first system was? Mm, no more hand signatures. So there were things like that that I spent two years working through. In pulling the board back together and working with our board, they said, what's next? We've, we've cleaned up. We've gotten a great car review. We're turning around retail sales. We've put benefits in place. We've done all of these things to begin really making this an organization to be proud of. What's next? I raised my hand and said, I need a mentor. I need a mentor that has grown an organization from a business perspective that can help me with the change management. The board set up wonderful, wonderful meetings with amazing leaders here in this community. I got the proverbial pat on the head, oh, y'all do good work. Nobody wanted to talk about change management. Nobody wanted to talk about strategies. Nobody wanted to talk about leadership. That was a really big aha for me. In fact, I didn't know what to do with it. So. What happened next is a part of my faith and my belief <laughs> because I'm, I'm a praying person and I totally believe that there is um, a God who is in control of all of it. I got an email, yes we have computers at this juncture and emails, and um, I got an email from the Harvard Business Schools Alumni Association offering nonprofit leaders a full scholarship to an initiative in Atlanta, Georgia, for which I met none of the criteria to include being a Harvard graduate. Okay? <laughs> guess what I did? I applied, and guess what happened? I got it. To Atlanta I went. Coolest two years of my life. The first thing that happened was you spent a day learning about business whether it was leadership or business things or financial things or fundraising or whatever, you spent a day every other month doing that. And then once a quarter, I was partnered with a for-profit leader, a passionate for-profit leader. The one I learned the most from was in the middle of the Bell South AT&T conversion, and I learned incredible things about strategy and change management from them. You signed a confidentiality agreement and you had knowledge of things that nobody else was willing to share. It totally changed my leadership. Totally. One of the last sessions that we had from a learning perspective was with an organization called Right Path. And here's what I learned about in that session that has shaped our organization. Everybody has natural hardwiring. That hardwiring is just repetitive behaviors. Spontaneity is, could be a hardwiring. Methodical could be a hardwiring. Quiet can be a hardwiring. Verbal can be a hardwiring. Everybody has hardwiring. And when you use your hardwiring appropriately, you're the most incredible leader that exists. But when you overuse your hardwiring, any virtue in excess really becomes a vice. Here are my vices. I'm verbal, imagine that. I'm very challenging. You don't believe me? Ask the path crow. <laughs> On top of that, I'm incredibly resourceful. So when you couple those things together, my virtue in excess becomes, not only can I see the vision and tell you about it, but because of this methodical bent and this resourcefulness, I can also see the steps to get to the vision. And I see it very quickly. That's my problem. It's a gift, but it's a problem. And once I began to recognize that that's my issue and that I have to slow down so that everybody in the organization can keep up and do their jobs and do them well, the light bulbs came on. I spend 70% of my time now coaching other people and casting and recasting vision. That's my job. I have wonderful team members that take care of the day-to-day -day things, but they also spend time doing that too. 
because out of this last day in Atlanta 12 years ago, we as an organization embraced Right Path, applied for a foundation grant for which we weren't qualified for and we got the grant and have embraced Right Path in that hardwired profile that we use, not just for our board, but for all of our leaders. And it's molded and shaped our culture. If you're going to be successful with us, here are the three things you got to be able to do and do well. You got to hit your results. You got to. None of us can stay in business if you can't nail the results. You got to know what your results are and you got to hit them. The second piece is relationships. You have to be able to form transparent and real drama-free relationships. People have to be able to trust you as the leader and believe you. Results, relationships. Here's the third piece that most companies don't do. Develop others. We're an organization that believes in growth. We're an organization that believes that learning never stops. And we're an organization that believes that every single person hasn't hit their potential yet. So developing others is not sending your team to a meeting or to a two-day conference. Developing others is looking at leadership behaviors and figuring out what is that virtue in excess that gets in the way of them being the best leader they can be. And our biggest aha there has been everybody's got baggage. Everybody. Everybody's got something. For us, results, relationships, and developing others. If you're going to be successful in a leadership role with goodwill, that's, that's what we look for. So as I was driving in this morning, I currently live in Lumpkin, getting ready to move to the backwaters. Either way, I get a drive every day, which is great. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard this song, but it's, it's um, a letter to a younger me. I don't know. It's, it's a new song, so I'm not dating myself. All right. Um, I just made a list of things that if I were to write a letter to myself, and I were in my early 20s, what would I want to know? What would I want to know that would have helped me sooner? And the first thing that I did was, it is not about me. Check your ego at the door. It is about the 720 families that we are responsible for caring for that we employ every day. It is not about me. It is not... And I don't do this part well oftentimes because, again, remember that any virtue and excess vice, I'm way out here and I have to pull back. I don't always start with why. If you start your messaging with why, it connects the dots faster. It really does. I have no doubt in my mind that I was created... So that I could fulfill my purpose. And my purpose is to develop bold and diverse leaders. To push them to places that are uncomfortable, but really empower them. And I get to do it. I get to do it every day. Every day. Know your purpose. <coughs> know your purpose. And know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it's fun when you're living in that space and that you find a vocation that allows you to live in that space. Don't just go to work to earn a paycheck. Know what you're great at. Know what gets in your way. I think I've been pretty honest about both of those pieces. Um, God gives us all instincts for a reason. Trust them. And when your instincts are screaming at you, stop, get the facts, and think about it. For me, when I'm not listening and something doesn't feel right, first thing that happens, and all of us have this, we have a physical response when something's not right. I get the butterfly thing, sweaty palms. 
I mean, there are times that when the team laughs, I'll put my hands on the coal conference room table and I'll lift my hand up and there's a hand mark there. My instincts are screaming and I've got to process. I've got to make sure I've got the facts and I'm not making emotional decisions. Use data, not emotion, for decisions. Become masterful at asking the right questions at the right time because guess what? Nobody in the room is expected to have all the answers. You guys aren't expected to have all the answers. You are expected to engage your knowledge and ask questions that lead the team to a better answer. A better answer. These are, um, this next one is one that I have seen more people lose their jobs over than anything. If you don't have a personal work system, you're not going to make it. And I know that sounds really elementary, but I can't stress that enough. Whether it's lists on your phone, whether it's a filing system, whether it's your computer, whatever your personal work system is, if you can't describe your personal work system to somebody and know that the things that you're expected to do are scheduled and are going to get done, something big will fall through the cracks and bite you in the butt. It will. I've seen more people lose their jobs over that than anything. Make sure today you know what your personal work system looks like and you know you can adapt it for those of you that are spontaneous, you're going to hate it, but I promise you, it will make you successful. For those of you that are methodical, you may overuse it. You may like to scale back just a little bit. Personal work system. And then the last thing that our organization has learned that has really been, we're going through it right now with um, all the new FLSA, the Department of Labor, Fair Labor Standards Overtime Guidelines. We're going through it right now. Doing the right thing the right way is hard. It's hard. There is no easy way out. It's just hard. So I share all of this to encourage you to get to know you and what you were created to do. And don't just go through school and your classes because somebody suggested it. Know you're supposed to be in it. Ask yourself hard questions. I am thrilled that I know so many of the people in this room today and some that we've worked with before, lots we've worked with before actually. And I'm just as thrilled that Y'all are at the cusp of your future. And I'm excited for you. And I know the things you're learning today, not just here in this room today, but in your classes today, are truly molding and shaping your future. So my thoughts and prayers are with you as you go through your journey and complete it sooner rather than later. And I just, I wish you all well. I will answer questions if we have time. And if y'all need to stand up and jump around, that's okay too. Sitting gets boring at 11 o'clock in the morning. Yes? Ms. Seckinger, first of all, I have to tell you, I'm deeply inspired by your story. <laughs> and I think I would like to thank you on behalf of CSU for giving us so generously of your time, sure. time and inspiring our students. <laughs> Because uh, what we're trying to do here is not just training the students to have a job in business, but also a way to give back to society. And I think you have the best job in the world because, mm -hmm. and because you get to do both. You, you get to create value added, like we say, in business, but you also are giving hugely back to the community and also transforming lives. Every day you transform lives, which is amazing. I read um, something wonderful about Goodwill, um, um, in the, I think it was in the Ledger Enquirer four days ago when they announced that you would be coming to talk to us, that you had raised the revenues of Goodwill from something like 2.9 million to 27 million during your tenure as CEO, okay. which is just amazing. I mean, it is amazing even for a business, a profit-making business to do it. And so for a non-profit business to do it, it's just spectacular. 
Could you maybe share with us how you did this? Data. <laughs> Get the emotion out of it. <laughs> you just, you, you have to learn your business. You have to learn um, what are the few things that matter. Where are you in comparison to others on those few things that matter? Make a plan, work the plan. And, you know, revenue is just more zeros. Don't let it intimidate you. And coming from the person that didn't want to take a business class, <laughs> if I can stand here and say revenue is just more zeros, anybody can do this. I'm serious. Data. Know your business, make a plan, work your plan. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, in the back. Um, so I know you said in what, 1999 you guys only had one computer. Yeah. I'm just curious, do you have any idea how many you have now? Terry, how many About computers? 200. Okay, 200. <laughs> <laughs> Many of you are in accounting from a business perspective? Okay, we can use you guys tremendously as volunteers. We do the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program in town and do four to six thousand free tax returns a year, generate about six million dollars back to the community. We need volunteers. We'll do all the training, we'll do all the certifications, everything. So we would love to have as many accounting folks that do that. Others do it too, but for me, I'm not quite gifted there. So I, I naturally swing it towards those accounting folks. But there are a lot of individuals that volunteer that, that are not accounting majors. So we would love to have you guys. Other questions? Yes? Um, during your story, you mentioned a lot of mentors who were male, and also in your intro, uh, it was mentioned you were one of few females, now a few more. Um, so what would you say some challenges you feel like you have faced, particularly being a female? People thinking that they're challenges. That's the number one challenge. When I was interviewing for this, for this job, um, <coughs> One of the individuals interviewing me um, asked me the question, um, are you going to be successful in a male-dominated world? And I just, I'm like, what? I, I, I just never thought about it. And I started rewinding, and I'm like, well, my first job was at Lockheed, and I was the only female. And I climbed around in airplanes in a skirt. Um, I've been in banking. I've been in real estate development. I, I don't think about it. It's, it's about how you lead. Um, and if you're consistent enough and you're predictable enough, it doesn't matter. And don't get dragged down by the assumptions and be able to sift through all the noise. And it seems like you have mastered that. Oh, right. Who are you? And congratulations. I like you. <laughs> there's so much noise. Yeah, there's a lot of noise. I, I just I don't think about it. Um, and sometimes it does come out of nowhere and you're like, whoa, what was that? So my encouragement is do it and do it well and go for it. Another thing we'd like our business students to learn from you is you have excellent communication skills, excellent communication skills. And we, we frequently tell our students that communication is very, very important. I think communication skills matter even more than math skills because these days computers do a lot of the calculation for us, but they, they need to communicate the way you do because computers don't communicate very well. <laughs> well, you don't want my answer to that. That's because I went to communication school because I was afraid of business school. So. <laughs> it's a critical yeah. skill. It, it is important, and we, we challenge all of our leaders to be able to tell the story and to break down what some people perceive as very complex things so that everybody can understand it. And I, I do challenge all of you to be able to do that. Um, the senior team talks, my senior team talks about that a lot. We have to be able to cast the vision in very, very simple terms. So that, that was a big learning for me. Is to, it's, it's not about what you know. It's about whether or not you can share it with other people. 
Um, and I, I went through a lot of pain with that one. My executive coach is also here who owns Right Path Resources in the back. And he was in town working with us and with Tesis and some other companies this week and I invited him to join us. But um, you know, he can tell you all kinds of learnings that I've had that I really don't want to talk about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but that's the other thing that's important. You gotta have a third party that'll give you the truth. And sometimes you don't want to hear the truth. So we've been working together for twelve years. Can you ask a question? Yes. What is your personal work system? Did you mention like lists or my personal work system is my calendar. My calendar and then I have lists that go that work with it. Um, I used to have a physical manual one to thirty one, January to December, and I've moved away from that now because I've moved away from so much of the paper. But it's it's my calendar. Um, if it's going to get done, if it's not calendared, it doesn't happen. <laughs> so, including haircuts. <laughs> I mean, everything goes on the calendar. And you just, you have to, and I'm not saying you have, you know, 15 different calendars. One for the kids, one for this, one for the, you can't do that. you got to have one calendar. <laughs> and, you know, you, people just have to get over it that your haircut's on the calendar. <laughs> so, you're welcome. Other questions? Okay, I have business cards here somewhere. Bridget has them. I, call me. I, I love, I'll get you two seconds. I, I love being a part of helping people find their passion. I love being a part of helping you identify what you're naturally great at because if you can get that hard wiring and that passion to align with a paycheck, buddy, you're going to have fun the rest of your life. Yes? As you said, you use the calendar as you work. Uh, you mentioned just a while ago that you were in like realtor and all these other jobs. Based on those past or previous experiences, what um, how do I say this? What made you develop that type of system in essence? Well, first of all, um, I'm 54 years old. And when I started out in the real estate development business, I had a bag phone for a cell phone. Anybody know what a bag phone looks like? Okay. It was so big and heavy that you left it in your car and you really didn't use it. So it was a list. I had notebooks and lists and files, one to 31. That's how I kept up with it. It was paper driven. So, and, and it was more, I was not a realtor, I was in development and I worked with development corporations and did residential and commercial developments. Um, worked, did a lot of the development at noon and exit 47. We did the trade free zone there and White Oak development, um, the golf courses, those types of things. That was my first experience. Then I've, I've worked um, a lot with, I did a lot of work with um, some some others, Callaway Gardens. Um, I'm trying to think who else I've done development work with. Us. I mean, I've built banks when I was in banking, and I've I don't know how many things we've done, Terry. And we don't even count anymore. We've gotten out of all of the substandard facilities into really nice, great work environments for our team members. So it's a, it's technology is a good thing when it's not overused. Don't hide behind it. <laughs> Other questions? I heard of someone that they insist on taking a, uh, I think they call it a digital Sabbath, once a week, for like an entire day where they're not connected. That's good. At all. If I didn't have a 20 year old soon to be 21, I'd probably do that too. But usually that's how you hear from him. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that, that's a good thing. It's interesting. Um, along those same lines, I had a, a friend who, whose um, husband owns a technology company, and he said, from time to time, you need to unplug it all and let it reset. He said, that means yourself and all the physical things that are processing. Yeah. How did you get this culture of service in your mind? And how do you, everything you do is about service. I don't know that I got a culture of service. I think my values are so strong, I refused for it to be anything that violated them. And 
I think that manifests and looks like a culture of service, but really and truly, it's about love and care. I mean, even for all the students in the room today, because my, my, my desire for them is that they find that hard wiring and that passion and that their vocation be totally fulfilling. So it's, it's, it's about them. It's about everybody else. Does that make sense? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Other questions? Do you want to ask something or are you just grinning? Uh, I'm just, I just like smiling. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> anybody else? It has been a joy to be with you. She's got business cards. Please, anytime, you're welcome at Goodwill. Thank you. Thank you.